Welcome back to the IBD School Basics Series. This episode, IBD School 104, explains our current understanding of what causes and what doesn't cause IBD. It can hit you like a bolt of lightning. One minute you think you're fine, and in the next minute your life is forever changed. You've been given a diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. If you were hit by lightning, you would know what you should have done differently, gotten out of the storm. But when you're hit with IBD, most people want to know, how could I have avoided this storm? If you have IBD, you are not alone. There are over 1.5 million people in the U.S. who suffer from IBD in the forms of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. That's more than one out of every 225 people in the U.S. What happened? What did I do to have this happen to me? Let's face it, when the doctor told you for the first time that you have Crohn's disease or colitis, your reaction was probably one of disbelief and shock. And the first question we are asked by newly diagnosed patients is why? What caused my IBD? This video will address this question. One thing you can be sure of is that nothing you did or did not do gave you this disease. That's right, it's not what you ate or didn't eat. It was not caused by your lifestyle. Whether you were on the go and anxious or laid back and calm, you did not cause this. So if you or someone close to you may think that you caused your Crohn's disease or colitis, that is not the case. Don't blame yourself for it. In the next few minutes, I'll explain what factors are associated with the onset of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Let me start by turning back the clock to look at two children, one who will later develop IBD and one who won't. From birth onward, they are the same. They both have healthy flora in their systems. These are the bacteria and other organisms that live in our intestines and help break down the food we eat and convert it into usable nutrients. But at some point, most often between the ages of 15 and 35, something happens in the immune system of our eventual IBD patient. The intestinal immune system normally protects us from any invasion by bacteria in the intestines. When a few bacteria get past the gut lining, a small amount of inflammation is usually needed to kill the bacteria off, then the inflammation is turned off and the gut heals. In IBD, the gut immune system is activated to attack the intestinal bacteria with inflammation, but it gets stuck in the on position and can't turn off the inflammation. I know what you're thinking. It must be the bacteria. Surely there's some particular bacterial infection that we should be able to treat with antibiotics. Unfortunately, years of research have not been able to identify a particular bacteria that's at fault. The problem appears to start with a mistake by the gut immune system and an inability to turn off inflammation. In both children, they have episodes in which bacteria activate the immune system, and they may temporarily get diarrhea from the inflammatory response. But while most people can turn off the inflammation and get better, our eventual IBD patient's immune system launches an intense attack that it cannot turn off, and chronic intestinal inflammation results. What factors make this more likely to occur? There are three groups of factors that have been identified. The first group of factors is genetic. As of 2011, more than 70 different genes have been identified that are associated with an increased risk of IBD. The majority of these genes function in some way to identify bacteria or defend the gut against bacteria. You can even make the argument that there are not truly two forms of IBD, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but really more than 70 different types. However, most people with a mutation in one or more of these 70 genes never get IBD. That is because the increased risk for IBD from any one gene is quite small. The second group of factors is things that influence the barrier between the gut bacteria and the immune system of the intestine. Things that affect this barrier include taking non pain medicines like aspirin or ibuprofen, which cause mild damage to the lining of the intestine. This also includes viral or bacterial infections of the gut, like salmonella or E. coli, which can also damage the gut barrier. Damage to the gut lining increases the amount of contact between the intestinal bacteria and the gut immune system. People with IBD often have unusually high levels of antibodies against pieces of gut bacteria, suggesting that their immune systems have been trying to fight off a perceived invasion by these bacteria. People who use non pain medications or have these infections are more likely to later develop IBD. Again, the increase in risk is fairly small. The vast majority of people who take pain medicines or get intestinal infections never develop IBD. The third group of factors is the environment. Things like frequent use of antibiotics, living in a very clean environment without parasites, and eating a lot of red meat can increase the risk of IBD by a small amount. 
These factors probably explain why IBD is fairly common in Western countries and relatively rare in places like Africa. As you can see, each factor only has a small influence on the risk of developing IBD. In most people, it likely requires a combination of factors and multiple factors acting together to start IBD. In short, it takes being unlucky multiple times to get enough factors to cause IBD. If it's the beginning of Crohn's disease, this activation of the immune system probably often happens in the last part of the small intestine called the terminal ileum, where there are many gut immune cells. But it can happen anywhere in the digestive system. If it's the beginning of ulcerative colitis, this overactivation of the immune system usually starts in the last part of the large intestine in the rectum. In either case, the immune system will continue for life attacking the digestive system. The gut immune system launches suicide attacks against the bacteria in the intestine, causing a lot of damage to the intestine itself from severe inflammation and scarring. The two children we started out with will have very different lifestyles as adults. One will be dealing with IBD for a lifetime. The other probably will never even know what IBD is. My father has Crohn's disease. Did I catch it from him? No, no one can catch Crohn's disease or colitis, but it does sometimes run in families. If we look into the family histories of our two people, it's more likely that we'll find other family members with IBD in our patient's family. Our patient didn't catch it from a family member, but perhaps our patient inherited a genetic tendency to have an overactive immune system one that had the potential to someday begin attacking the normal contents of a digestive system if something sets it off. Since this is an area people often ask about, let's look at some numbers. Out of every 10 people with IBD, three will have a family history of the disease, and seven will have no family history of IBD. If you have IBD, what are the chances your children will have it? Let's consider 100 children born to 100 families where one parent has IBD. Likely, three to seven of these children will develop IBD eventually. Keep in mind here that we're talking about a very small percentage, only about five out of 100. What if both parents have IBD? Here the risks are higher. Out of 100 children born to 100 families where both parents have IBD, it's likely that 45 of these children will develop IBD. But even in this case, more than half will not develop the disease. So what is the trigger? If it's not simply genetics, what causes the immune system to make such a life-changing mistake? I'll share some areas of research with you. Some investigators believe that the defect may be in what we call the first responders of the immune system. These immune cells go into action within the first minute of an injury or infection. It's this line of research that has spawned treatments that slow down the production of cells from the bone marrow in an attempt to change these first responders. This approach to treatment can be effective but can also have some risks. We have learned that many of the drugs that slow down these first responders increase the risk of activation of viral infections like shingles and the risk of skin cancer and lymphoma. Another approach along these lines is bone marrow transplantation, which is quite dangerous but can put IBD into remission sometimes for years, but eventually the IBD is reactivated. It appears that you can reset the immune system, but the genetic susceptibility to reactivation is still there. Other investigators believe that the defect may be in a completely different set of immune system cells. Those that study the enemy send signals to other immune cells to produce specific receptors or antibodies against the enemy or produce surface proteins that let immune cells attach to the wall of the blood vessel and go into action in the intestine a few days after an injury or infection. From this area of research come therapies, usually antibodies, that block the cell signaling proteins produced by inflammation in people with IBD. Let me touch also on research involving environmental factors. One link that has been established is the link between cigarette smoking and Crohn's disease. We do know that cigarette smokers are more likely to develop Crohn's disease than non-smokers, and there is no doubt among experts that smoking makes Crohn's disease worse and makes therapies for Crohn's disease less effective. In general, a Western diet with fewer vegetables and more red meat is a risk factor for IBD. Other factors associated with IBD are use of antibiotics, living in an environment where human parasites are rare, regular use of non-steroidal pain medicines, and growing up in an industrialized country. But the search for the cause continues to lead us only to the conclusion that a wide range of circumstances must come together in an unfortunate perfect storm to cause the immune system to malfunction. And for most people, even this perfect storm of circumstances doesn't cause IBD. 
I know they're doing all this research, and I'm hoping that they're close to finding a cure, but I mean, is that even realistic? How close are they to finding a cure? Am, am I ever going to be free of this disease? None of us can put a time frame on when or even whether a cure will be found for IBD. Will there someday be a breakthrough that gives us a complete permanent remission? We don't know. But we are continuing in making steps towards improving the effectiveness of treatments that can help control the disease and reduce flare-ups. That means that someone diagnosed today has a better chance than ever before at living a normal life, even with IBD. Will my IBD get better over time? Most patients will have periods of remission, but active disease returns eventually, which is why doctors recommend maintenance medication in IBD. A few patients will see lessening of symptoms after age 60, as some people have reduced activation of their immune system as they get older, but it does not happen to most people with IBD. In fact, many patients have the start of their IBD in their 50s and 60s. Living with IBD means you need to take an active role in managing the disease. You need to learn more about IBD and learn more about your options for treatment. I want to sum up by answering one question very clearly. If you ask me, is there anything I could have done to prevent getting IBD? The answer is no. There's nothing you could have done differently. You were caught without warning in a perfect storm. And you'll need to protect yourself from that storm for the rest of your life. And so it is now time to look forward instead of back for answers. Because when the question is about the future, there are many answers, many steps you can take to make your life with IBD easier, healthier, and more under your control. We'll explore how you can do this in future episodes of the IBD School Basics Series.